And the two boys knelt beside their beds to say their prayers. The younger one began praying at the top of his lungs. I pray for a new bicycle. I pray for a new PlayStation. His older brother leaned over, nudged him and said, Why are you shouting? God isn't deaf. It isn't deaf. To which the little brother replied, But no, Grandma is. <laughs> you know, as I shared a Bible study on Wednesday, I love Christmas. I love the decorations, the music, uh, time with family, at least most of them, and the biblical accounts that surround Christ's birth. You know, God did some amazing things surrounding the coming of His Son, and basically we are introduced to people that we would know absolutely nothing about except for their involvement in the events of the coming of our Savior. Now my favorites of all those characters around Christmas are Jesus' earthly parents. Mary, probably most of all. And it's been a while since we have focused some attention on her, so this morning what I'd like you to do is turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. As again, we go through some familiar territory, but I would ask you to not let familiarity rule the day, but ultimately look for what God would teach you at this time, where you are in your life, and the circumstances you're in, and just the example of what uh, Mary brings to us in terms of all that she went through and all God did surrounding her. She really must have been an amazing woman. Really a teenager, a young teen even, more likely 13 to 15 years old as far as what would be a more appropriate marrying age, marrying age in the first century. I mean, we don't much know much about her, but the glimpses we get of her faith, her obedience, and knowledge of Scripture reflect well on God's choice. So let's start with Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 26. It says, In the sixth month God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You know, when Luke writes here, in the sixth month, he really is referring back to what he has been writing about so far. And that is the miraculous means by which John the Baptist was conceived. In some ways, the story of Jesus really does start with the story of John the Baptist. The fact that, miraculously, God took an old and barren woman, and like he did with Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife, allowed her to have a son. And that son, like we read at the beginning of service today, for those of you who are on time, nudge, nudge, hint, hint. Uh, but anyways, again, his, his song that he sang about his son, the one who would prepare the way for Messiah, and so... Uh, therefore, Luke is talking about when he says in the sixth month, it's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's, uh, from Zachariah's wife, John the Baptist's mother, her pregnancy that Mary gets the message of the news coming to her. Now don't miss the awesome nature of God going to a place like Nazareth to choose his son, par son's parents. I mean, remember when Nathaniel, one of Jesus' disciples, when he first hears of Jesus of Nazareth, do you remember what he says? He says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, basically, when we think about Nazareth, we probably should think maybe in our minds, South Providence, or, or, or maybe Johnston, or whatever you would associate <laughs> with, like, like places that kind of like, well, like good people don't come from that, from that place. But again, it really speaks to the kind of people that do exist in those places and how God can use us in spite of ourselves. I mean, certainly compared to the locations around the world, in human terms, that are better places. Like, why not Rome? Why not ba Babylon? Why not Alexandria? And when you think about there would be Jewish people in all of those areas, certainly people of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David, that could have been chosen. Even when it comes to the, the area of Palestine, Jerusalem, or somewhere in Judea would be better. I mean, basically, people from Galilee in and of itself, the whole region was thought of poorly when it came to political leaders or educational, learned people or religious people. Again, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Again, Galileans were not thought of in terms of, again, how God would use things in a minor way. And, you know, we have to remember that God does use the weak. He does use the frail. In, in, in terms of what Paul says, to shame the wise, to make sure we know that the glory is coming from God and not from us. 
And so we just have to remember that Mary is an example of that, of the way God works. I mean, God certainly is doing and knows what he's doing in terms of not acting according to what we would think of what we would do in sending Gabriel to Nazareth. Now, mind you, Nazareth was also not a hole-in-the-wall place either. I mean, in other words, there were some strategic things about Nazareth that speaks to its value in terms of being an environment where the Son of God would be raised. I mean, basically, when you think of the trade routes that went east and west, east to west, to the ocean, um, uh, it came through Nazareth. So therefore, when you talk about the streets of Nazareth, there would be foreign merchandise and foreign people that would be coming through towns, uh, through that town, rather. There's also an aspect of the priestly duties that they would have in Jerusalem. Basically, that was... Uh, uh, coordinated around 24 rotations. Basically, 24 rotations would happen from people from the house of Aaron as well as the tribe of Levi that would come periodically, according to their turn, to Jerusalem to perform their service as priests. Well, what they would do is they would gather in 24 different towns around Judea or around Palestine, around Israel, in other words, and basically, Nazareth was one of those towns. So this priest would come in mass, if you will, and as a group traveling rather than coming singly. And again, Nazareth was one of those towns. So periodically, when it was people from that area, it would be their rotation. There would be a greater priestly influence or religious influence in the town at that time. Now, don't get me wrong. I think God's choice for Mary and Joseph was about who Mary and Joseph were. It wasn't about their location. But to the extent that we find that Nazareth really wasn't a good choice, to me, what that speaks to is the, is the greater character and nature of Mary and Joseph in terms of what God wasn't doing strategically in terms of identifying Nazareth. So maybe not so much Nazareth, but certainly identifying Mary and Joseph. But even to the extent that we see Nazareth having some benefit for that environment where Jesus would be raised, we can always be assured that God always has something up his sleeve. That God is never doing anything really by accident. I think there was an intent and a reason, naturally, why God chose Mary and Joseph, why he chose and put Mary and Joseph in that family, in that town, at that time. All these things that God is orchestrating. Well, certainly if Nazareth did not have the right pe worldly pedigree for a place for Jesus to be raised, Mary and Joseph even had less, at least in terms of what the word world would look at. I mean, a carpenter? Why a carpenter's family? What does that have to do with being the Messiah of Israel or the Savior of the world? From what they offered at the temple for Jesus' presentation there, we can see that Mary and Joseph were poor. So again, in terms of education, in terms of religious heritage, in terms of, again, the families they came from, again, not, nothing marked being there in terms of a reason why God would choose this couple. But again, what I say is that speaks more <coughs> about what kind of people Mary and Joseph were. See, what we have to understand in God choosing Mary and Joseph, he's making a statement of the kind of people that he uses. The kind of things we cannot use as an excuse why God can't use us. The place is falling apart. No. Um, that, in other words, the excuses we use why we can't be used. I mean, how many times do people say, well, I can't be used because I'm from this family. Or I was raised in this environment. Or I came from here. Or I don't have an education. I don't have this to offer. But what we have to understand is that God will use anyone who is faithful to Him. See, it's faith and it's obedience that God is looking for. And certainly, that's what Mary and Joseph had. Now understand, see, what I'm saying is that God wouldn't choose Mary and Joseph just because. You know, in other words, He's not going to overlook certain things. But He's also going to set aside other things that would be of worldly influence. And look at those things that would be about godly influence. What I like about the kingdom of God, what I like about the kingdom of heaven, is you can raise as far as you want to, up to and it's up to you. 
Not in terms of your intellect, about your material wealth, about anything about who you are, but just your faith, just your obedience, just your willingness to grow and learn about God. And so I think that's what, it, what it attracted God to Mary and Joseph and why he sent Gabriel to this place. And so just imagine being Mary, being in that place where the angel comes and says, Greeting you who are, five, who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. You know, Mary at this point in time in her life probably was being prepared to be a wife and a mother. Her life and her activities were involved with learning how to cook, learning how to clean, learning how to take care of a home, learning how to raise children, being, being a, a defunct babysitter in terms of taking care of children. So very simple life, very simple activities would occupy Mary's life. And yet in the midst of that, an angel comes and speaks well, you are highly favored in terms of the Lord. I think that if I can just imagine Mary thinking at that time, like, who are you talking about? So this reminds me of another situation, another person, another Israelite at a different time where he's, he's actually threading, threshing wheat in the wine press because he's afraid that the Midianites might come and steal it. And the angel comes to him and says, the Lord is with you, Gideon, mighty warrior. Mighty warrior, highly favored. No, you want to go 30 miles down, take the second street on the left, and that's where you find the mighty warrior. That's where you find the person that's skilled in battle. No, go to Jerusalem, Gabriel. That's where you're going to find the people that are highly favored of God. But no, Gabriel is saying, you're the one. You're the one that God has identified. Of all the people, of all the time, of all the women that could be chosen to be the mother of the Son of God, it was her. Just imagine that. Just imagine the kind of woman that Mary was in terms of her being chosen for that task. But again, for her to recognize the favor that was upon her, See, it's not the favor that she offered, it's a favor that was upon her. The graciousness that God was showing and choosing her. Again, she can't be not offering anything to the dynamic in terms of righteousness and character and godliness. But again, certainly not being worthy. Who would be? Who would be worthy to be the mother of Jesus? Who would be worthy to carry the Son of God? And yet God is working through the symbol. He works in humble ways. He works with simple people that are faithful to Him. So I would ask, what I would ask you is, in what ways is God trying to speak things into your life that defies rhyme or reason? In what unlikely ways is God calling you to a privilege and a task that is reflecting His favor and trust in you? To what extent are we making ourselves ready for that through faith and obedience and not letting any worldly designation hold us back? See, we have to be aware of the way that God moves. You know, God moves in very progressive ways. Every day God is transforming us. Even though we're wasting away, the book of 2 Corinthians says, even though we're wasting away on a daily basis, every day we're being renewed in our spirit and our new nature and the work that God is doing. And he's going to honor the faithfulness and the discipline that we have of being in his word and being in prayer and being in the spirit and living our lives for him and being righteous and developing character. All the things we're doing regularly in our Christian life, but then, boom, we have to be aware of the way that God shows up. That all of a sudden, all this stuff, all these things that I was doing each and every day was for this moment that the angel shows up. This moment that is go time, Mary. That now all that you've done in terms of your faithfulness has set you up for such a time as this that God needs a mother and it's you. That's the significance of what's happening here in Luke chapter 1. And again, speaks to the kind of woman that Mary was. Now look at Mary's response here. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. A very common thing, you know, when you're in the presence of angels... When you're in the presence of glory and godliness and God's presence being reflected through an angel, 
Very often people are troubled or afraid is really what that means. They're just wondering what's going on here. What kind of ingredient then must this be? But the angel said, do not be afraid. The most common things for angels to say to human beings is don't be afraid. I'm coming with good news. This is a good thing that God is accomplishing. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So again, all the things that God is going to be accomplishing, all the things that God is going to be doing, God is preparing, God is informing. Again, He's giving her the plan, He's laying things out, because basically uh, she, she needs to know the information in terms of how God is preparing her. But notice the question that Mary asks here. How will this be, Mary asked the angels, asked the angels since I am a virgin? Now, I want you to compare verse 34 to verse 18 in chapter 1. See, basically, Mary says, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? In verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Do you see the difference? I mean, Zechariah ultimately, because of that question... Because of the lack of faith that that question reflects, the angel said to him, you are now going to be dumb until this child is born. That you're going to be robbed of speech. That because you didn't give the right answer, because of the fact that your, your, your heart is not in that place that just says, be as it will, God. Whatever you say goes. I'm available and unwilling. Rather than saying, how is that going to happen? What, what, I, I, I'm not sure you're going to do this, so please, can you give me some sort of sign that this is you? And so now it's, it's funny that ultimately uh, Zachariah is really asking for a sign, and then he becomes the sign. He now comes out of his precinct of uh, uh, responsibilities, and now he can't talk. And people are wondering, what, what, what happened in there? It seems, like he, it seems like he saw an angel, and guess what he did? And now he becomes a sign of what God is doing in John the Baptist's life, in his life, in terms of the glory being expressed there. But see, his is a question. His question is showing doubt. Basically, Mary's question is really showing faith. Because what she's asking is, how is this going to happen? Not, not, is it going to happen? Can I be sure it's going to happen? But because I'm sure it's going to happen, and you're talking about me having a baby... How does that work? Because I'm a virgin. Like, am I supposed to do something? Am I supposed to get like find a guy or get married to Joseph early? Or again, I, I believe what you're saying. But now what I have to say is what, what logistical things might you be asking for in terms of how is this happening? See, the only thing she could understand in terms of where babies come from, again, she knew the birds and the bees, and, and, and how that happens. It's for a man and a woman to be together. And since she hadn't been with a man, or wouldn't be with a man until she was married, the way it's supposed to be, nudge, nudge. But, uh, but again, that um, she is saying, well, like, uh, this is the only thing I can conceive of conception happening in that way. But God is saying, no, a miracle is going to happen. That basically, no, it's going to be God that's going to provide the, the human genome, the, 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 the male dynamic, the male chromosomes that will be part of Jesus. So he will be man and he will be God because there is flesh in him. There, there, are, there are the chromosomes that come from Mary, that come from the woman, that are human. And then the Holy Spirit will provide the divine aspect. I mean, this has never happened before and never will happen again because it's not necessary, because it's only necessary to be one Jesus for one life, for one sacrifice, on one cross, for the salvation of all people for all time. Amen. Amen. So it will never happen again, but the miracle of what God is accomplishing in this girl because of her faithfulness, again, of all the women of all time, of all Jewish people from in the house of Judah, in the house of the line of Judah, in the house of David, again, Mary is the one who is identified here. And she's just simply asking, uh, how do I do this? How does this happen? 
No, the angel tells her. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be called will, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she was said to be barren and is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I mean, how, how much is that the tenor and tone of our lives? How much are we operating in our lives with the thought, the sentiment, the conviction, the faith that nothing is impossible for God? Because you know something, that is, that is part of the message of Christmas. Part of the message of Christmas is God does um, uh, amazing and uh, impossible things in un unexpected ways. And uses unexpected people and unexpected circumstances to do miraculous and powerful and privileged things. I mean, ultimately, as well as it is, God is showing her favor in terms of what he is, sees in her that makes her the right mother. How much trust is he placing in her? In terms of just what she should internalize as a responsibility that is now hers. But again, as she is living her life, as we are living our lives, are we believing that nothing is impossible for God? I mean, whenever we are dealing with fear, anxiety, insecurity, how is nothing is impossible for God going to address that? When we think about the things that God is calling us to in terms of obedience, overcoming sin, dealing with people, dealing with circumstances, dealing with financial issues, dealing with whatever you have, to say that nothing is impossible with God. See, that God can do anything He wants. So to what extent is our prayer life invigorated, empowered, and convicted as we're praying that nothing is impossible for you? You know, even when we think about praying for a situation like Sarah Laffey, where we can believe and our, our prayers are guided by the faith that nothing is impossible. You could heal her, God, in an instant. But it's thy will be done. It's your will. It's hallowed be your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So even, see, our responsibility in our prayer is to bring faith. And part of that faith is nothing is impossible for you. But then I lay it at the feet of the God who nothing is impossible for, understanding that He has a will and a purpose that I just don't understand. And that He can accomplish things through what I might see as bad, that I might not understand in terms of what He might be orchestrating, but I trust Him. But in the context of my faith, what I am believing, what guides my life, what empowers me in the day is nothing is impossible for me. Don't even say that I can't do this. I can't overcome this sin. I can't stop this. I, I, I can't perform this ministry. I can't go here in terms of where you're leading me. No, nothing is impossible for God. If God is leading and God is providing, we need to walk in His way. And not let whatever, whatever finiteness, whatever weakness, whatever frailty, whatever uh, incapacity that we feel to accomplish the will of God, we need to let the whole sentiment of what this angel is saying to Mary, that nothing is impossible with God, just set those things aside. And just decide that we believe that about God. I love Mary's response. I, I think this, this, this is, again, is a, is a window, is an indication of why Mary is the girl, why she's the woman, why she's the one chosen by God. I am the Lord's servant. I, I really, I, just tell me what I have to do and what I don't have to do. Otherwise, it's in your hands. I'm available to you. You know, for all the things that pregnancy will be, will mean for her all that it could mean in terms of, you know, what is this going to do for Joseph? How, how's my community going to respond? I'm going to be a white woman with a baby and, and not have someone that I'm connected with? What's, none, none of those questions. And, and so I'm sure it was in her mind. I'm sure it's something she's dealing with. Again, she wasn't absent of human emotion and the things that she would struggle with. But again, the, the bottom line of her life is, I am the Lord's servant. 
that I do what you say. I, I, I make myself available to you in terms of whatever you would have. And again, she even says it here. May it be to me as you have said. See, not in doubt. How is this going to happen? Well, it's, it's a little bit about how, um, But it's just going to happen. Be sure of this. How, you know, I'm old and she's old and she's barren. How is this going to happen? No. Be, however, however you see the fit to make it happen, I am available to you. You know, what's interesting in terms of this whole account is that Mary, after hearing this news and hearing Elizabeth, who is her relative, by the way, and it says actually in terms of the account of John the Baptist's birth, that Elizabeth herself was in the family of Aaron. And so therefore, there actually could be a priestly connection with Mary through her mother in terms of just, just, just what pedigree she does have in terms of what might be valuable, in terms of raising Jesus. But ultimately, she decides to go visit Elizabeth. I don't, I don't think it's to con, con, confirm what the angel has said about Elizabeth, but ultimately, to be able to commiserate, to, to gain encouragement, to gain insight into what God has spoken to her, as well as sharing what God has spoken to, to herself. And so therefore, she makes this trip. What I find interesting is, as uh, Mary is making this trip, and she at this point, uh, really, does it, does it say at that time? Yeah, so, so she, she's, she, she's like just pregnant, if not pregnant yet, and she's going down and spending time with Elizabeth. And, you know, you just wonder, you know, this isn't um, the days of automobiles or, or trains or buses or airplanes. I mean, she's trekking on a donkey. You know, who knows what means she would have to travel, sometimes walking uh, in terms of the mode of transportation. But again, taking the 70 mile or so trek from Nazareth to Jerusalem, where, um, where Elizabeth would have been, and not knowing that she was going to make that same trip by, in full term. You know, she, she, she makes, like, I wonder if, like, if this was a, um, if this was a time of email... Or, or maybe Morse code or telegraph or whatever you would have, you know. Might Mary say, you know, okay, in Jerusalem already, stop. Uh, baby's supposed to be born in Bethlehem, stop. Uh, meet me there, Joseph, please stop. Has the angel seen you too? You know, like, like what she, she have said, I really don't want to make that trip again. I don't want to go 70 and then 6 miles to Bethlehem. Full term, I'm already here, but she treks down to Jerusalem and then will trek back to Nazareth and then find out that Bethlehem is in fact the place that Jesus will be born. And God will orchestrate that in a whole different way in terms of uh, Jesus' birth. But So at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed the child you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who, is, who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And this is what Mary says. And listen to this in terms of, again, just what it speaks about who Mary is. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers and thrones. Rulers from their thrones, he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months and then returned home. And so again, the, the, this passage here says a lot about just what, the, what kind of woman, what kind of girl Mary is. And the first thing we know, just quickly in terms of going through these things, that she's a woman that knew Scripture, that she was grounded in the Word. When you look at the things that she says here in the Scriptures that she's referring to, primarily Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 
uh, as a primary source, source, as well as Psalm 103. I mean, how important was it for the mother of Jesus, the one who would be uh, an, an instrumental part of him being raised to become the son of, to, well, to, he was the son of God, to be this Messiah in Israel, to follow through on the plan that God had for him. There was still a need for Jesus to make choices. There was still a need for Jesus to be obedient. And so again, for him to be instructed in the home where the word of God was active, where it's living, that it was spoken, that it was on the doorpost, it was on their heads, it was on their hearts, it was something they lived out, it's something they referenced to. It wasn't a Bible on a coffee table, it wasn't we go to synagogue on Saturday, then we don't talk about it the rest of the week. No, the environment of the home was, was one of the word of God. In terms of, again, what she's referencing. Again, it's, it's a glimpse. It's a glimmer. You know, I don't think Mary is faking this. Let, let me, just in case I'm called to be the son of, the mother of the Son of God, let me prepare this speech so I know what verse, so I sound like I'm spiritual. Or I know, no, this is something that is flowing from her heart, probably inspired by the Holy Spirit, in terms of what she's reflecting about what God is doing in her life. But the reference point for her is, is Scripture. Her life revolved around the Bible. Also, you can see here that she was humble. It is really unfortunate how people have misconstrued and misperceived and misunderstood this passage. And when she ever says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, holy is his name. And for them to say that Mary is saying something about her, literally Mary would roll over in a grave. Literally, Mary would look at that person and say, what? Not only, not only am I not saying that, I'm saying the exact opposite of that. You see this word, little word, for? From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And those are not going to call me blessed because of who I am. They're going to have to call me blessed because everyone is going to notice that when God does this for me, a humble person who has nothing to offer him, they're going to say, I was blessed by God. Yeah. See, basically, there's one of two ways of looking, about, uh, looking at this blessing. Either Mary is saying, I am blessed, so come to me. Or I am blessed, and so therefore go to God. And it's the second one that she's talking about here. That in no way would, is Mary asking for regard or, or, or faith or allegiance or, or dedication in terms of what she's saying here. In fact, she's talking about being a humble stir servant. She's talking about someone who needs mercy. She's talking about someone who needs salvation. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. That ultimately, again, I'm, I'm not great. God is great. But, but that's, that's where the favor lies. The favor lies in the fact that God is doing something miraculous, not in the kind of person that I am. And so therefore it said, we see that she knew her Bible, she, that she, she, that she was humble. The other thing that this expresses is that she, she really knew God and the kind of God that He is and the things that He would seek to accomplish. I and mean, when you think about the revolutionary things that she is saying here in terms of what it says about God, what it says about the kind of God that He is, the way that He is going to confront the world and turn the tides and turn the tables... And when you think about, again, where, where it goes on in terms of His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He is performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the most of He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He is, but He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And again, for a, for a, for a society, for a people, for humanity... That our designations, our regard, our orientation, again, what is your pedigree? What do you have to offer? What money do you have? What background? What family do you come from? What area of the country? What college do you go to? All those things that we use in terms of designation in our life, what Mary is saying is God turns a table on all of that. That ultimately what he is looking for in terms of us is our humility. And in terms of us recognizing Him to be the great God that He is, not, not what I have. And what she sees in terms of what He's accomplishing through her is, again, I'm the humble one. When, when, when this is talking about uh, God is going to uh, turn the tables and He's going to feed the poor and let the rich go away empty, she's saying, I'm the poor one. I'm the humble one. The reason why I can talk about God 
supporting the humble and defying the, the, the rich is because he's doing this for me. Amen. I mean, that's her reference point of being awed and filled with praise and regarding God for the kind of God he is if he's choosing a girl like her. But again, she's reflecting in this song. She's reflecting in, in what she's um, professing here. Again, she's talking about the greatness of that God. She's talking about, again, the way that that God works in terms of using humble people. Using people, and again, that the world would reject. The, the, the ones that the world would minimize and call secondary in terms of, again, whatever capacity the world is looking for. But again, that's not what God is, is using I mean, basically even choosing Israel in terms of them being a lesser people in terms of what they would accomplish in terms of his plan. And so we just have to understand, again, what this says about, what, what this says about Mary in terms of her faith, her regard for the word, her humility, her, her knowledge of God, her understanding of the kind of God that he is and what he's expressing in terms of what, uh, what he's done for her and what she's now really giving us all an opportunity to hear. That she, she's speaking these words that Luke, in his ex historical investigation, found out that Mary said this. <clears throat> you know, you think about how this made its way into the Bible. I mean, Luke was a, 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 was a history person. He, he's, he, he's the one that, you see, in other words, Matthew and Mark and John were all apostles who also rely on the, uh, much of their own evidence and their own experience with Jesus to find out what, um, what, what to, to give an account of what Jesus did. Luke, what he did is he, he interviewed people. He went around and asked people questions. And so the reason why he adds all this information about Mary in his gospel that is not in others is because, again, he's asking eyewitnesses to these events. So just imagine if Mary kept silence. Just imagine as, again, she's, she's, she's having this miraculous, powerful thing happen to her. She is now engaging with her cousin, her mother's sister, or mother's cousin. We're not sure what the re re relative nature is there. And now, this Elizabeth is experiencing a miracle. God does a miracle in terms of what is happening in Elizabeth's body when Mary comes in. And so Mary can't help. But again, just resounding praise for God in terms of just reflecting all the things that, again, it means for her, what it means for him, and what it means for us in terms of all the great things God is accomplishing through Christ. So let's bow and let's pray this morning. Father, we just are so grateful for Jesus and for all the things that he has come to this earth to accomplish. And in the fact that we have the opportunity to just think more deeply about just what it means that he came in a human body to, to human parents. You working incarnationally as you always had, working through the agency of human beings in terms of the faith and obedience that we bring to you. Father, I, I just pray that in our lives that we would just continue to believe and grow based in that. That we would just continue to be captivated by a God for whom nothing is impossible. And believe you to that extent, not to get what we want, but to accomplish what you want, which ultimately will be what we want. And so we're grateful for that. I just pray that you help us to understand the ways that you seek to minister this truth to our lives practically. In terms of what should change about the way we pray, what should change about our faith, what should change in terms of our obedience because of what Mary's experience with you shows about the God that you are and the kind of character you look for. Again, not, her not offering much in terms of earthly things, but certainly being a woman of godliness and character and your word and your spirit. And so, Father, we just thank you for her example and what she teaches us in, in terms of what just a simple life that she was ultimately living, that you just, uh, just transformed and used because of, because of who she is, uh, or she, who she is, was. And so, Father, we just uh, lift these things before you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.